Andre Smith is stuck in a Western Australian detention centre and we're going to find out why and what's been going on. He's somebody who served in our armed forces between 2001 and 2004 up in East Timor and he needs our help. And that's what we're about as Kiwis, especially in these COVID times. Dre, that's the name that everybody and calls you, isn't it? Do you prefer Absolutely. that to Andre? Lovely. Absolutely, yeah. But I do hey, hear that your grandmother, if she's cross with you, calls you Andre. So if you if you get an Andre from me, you know you have to pull your head in in this interview, okay? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know all my secrets. Yeah. I do. Huh? It's, it's, it's lovely to talk to you. Describe, let's begin with the location where you are and what it is like because yeah. people have seen these detention centres in Australia and they look, frankly, horrific. What's it like? Um. There's in, in some in some ways it's a lot worse than prison here. Um, it's um, look the the rooms and things like that is 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 not too bad. It's like a mining camp here. Um, the food the food is a lot worse um, than jail. Um, there's no nutritional guidelines at all to do with the food here. You know it's it's not fit for growing men at all. Um, give, give me an example. Give me give me an example of what you've eaten today. For example, what would you have for breakfast? Then? Uh, um, we don't get breakfast. We we get given some little cereal packs, you know. If you want to go and make breakfast, they give you little bags of cocoa pops, you know. Um, but we just went down for lunch then, and we get two two chicken drumsticks, and a couple of spoons of coleslaw, and some uh, maybe some hot chips or something, you know. Um, that, that is not it. enough. Yeah, that um, is not enough. It's some, okay. Some big boys here too, you know. Yeah. Okay, and then and then keep going. So you've got that. You've got obviously a very basic room behind you, and I would say that people can go on your TikTok and see lots yeah. of images of where you are, and we'll give that address out, and it will be underneath this interview. Uh, what else is it like, Dre? Yeah. What else? Describe um, what else it's like. Well, it's very multicultured. It's very multicultured. Um, mm. There's a lot of different cultures, and there are culture culture wars inside inside the uh, detention centres. Um, as you could probably, I don't know if you've seen up in Christmas Island, there's a lot of, a lot of riots and, and, and wars going on, cultural, ethnic wars between Africans, between Islanders, between Arabs, you know, it's all, it's pretty hectic, you know. Can um, anybody, it's can anybody, tension. it's very high tension. Is there anybody who's Absolutely. able to work across all the groups? Anybody who's, like, are you able to fit in with a lot of those different groups or is it, is it yeah, that we, we try and we try, we try and keep, um, well, the Islanders and the Maoris, we, we all stick together mm. um, and we, we, we keep, keep the peace as much as, as much as possible here, you know. It's seven o'clock on the night when my drops are cruising the streets. Mm. I got a real pretty, pretty little thing that's waiting for me. Oh, love anticipating. Oh, love, don't keep me waiting. I got a to put my hands in laces I never seen. You know what I mean? Let me take you to a place that's nice and quiet. Ain't nobody interrupt. Ain't got a rush now I just wanna take it nice and slow See, I've been waiting for this for so long Making love until the sun comes down And I just wanna take it nice and slow but it's we, we but it's very things. high tension, as you say. We've heard about that before. That it's it's tense and it's yeah. it's not a positive place to be. There's probably probably the, one of the hardest things about detention centres. We don't have an end date, you know. In prison, you have an end date. You've got a parole date. Then you've got your final date of your sentence. Here, there is no end end date. Some boys have been stuck here for thirteen years. Some some boys are here for eight eight years. They've been here and they're just sitting here rotting. They've got cancer. Some boys have got cancer while they've been in here. You know, oh, this so is not so get home. cruel. Okay, Tonga, so, so Tonga, for instance, to yeah. Tonga is not accepting any of the five hundred ones back to Tonga, but because the boys have committed crimes here, Australia won't commit, um, won't take them back or give them a visa. So they've been here for four years, just sitting trying to trying to apply for refugee visas in Fiji and different countries to try and get out of here. You know. 
This is so it's cool. We're life. going to get to that before we get to the 501 situation. And I don't like labeling you as 501s because you're human mm-hmm. beings and you're part of our whanau. You're part of our New Zealand family. But just tell me what the temperature is like there in Western Australia in that camp at the moment. What is it today? It's been over, it's been, it's been over 40 degrees um, for about the last 12 days, I think. Um, that is it, really relentless. Hot. How do you it's how really do you hot, cool yeah. off? How do you manage? Because there don't seem to be stay, many trees. No, there's no trees. We just we just stay in our rooms um, during the day as much as possible. You know, the door shut, um, trying to keep cool. We do have aircon down in the in the gym. Um, that, that, that's the thing with, with this place is there's no jobs for us. There's no work. Um, we have to earn points to um, to to have money to be able to spend at the little shop here. Um, so if we go to the gym for an hour, you get two points and you can accumulate 60 a week. Um, basically we, we get up in the morning and we go to the gym at eight o'clock in the morning cause it's too hot after that. Um, we go to the gym for an hour, we come back, we go to lunch, we come back, we just hang out in the rooms playing cards and things like that. And then when it cools down, finally about eight o'clock, we'll go and have a game of touch, touch rugby out on the basketball courts, you know? Are there books and things you can do to use your mind? Yeah, Liz, um, look, we, we can get things sent into us. A couple of the boys have PlayStations and things like that. Um, mm. you, you soon get sick of, sick of that, you know. We're, we're not really gamers and into that sort of thing, you know. So I, my, myself, I've been doing a lot of research and a lot of study and things like that ready to come home to, to get my business up and going again back in New Zealand. And that's a lovely story um, we're going to get we're going to get to in this. But first, we need to delve into what a five hundred one is. And you are not. Okay. Let's remember, you're not five hundred ones. You are Kiwi boys, and we need you home. Yeah, so, absolutely. so what is a five hundred one, Jay? Okay, a five hundred one. So, um, a lot of us boys were too proud when we first came to Australia twenty years ago, thirty years ago, ten years ago. We're too proud of being Kiwis to go and get Australian citizenships. Um, I never thought I'd ever come to prison. Um, so I didn't bother about citizenships and things like that. Mm. Um, basically anyone who, um, comes under a bad character can have their visa canceled under 501. 501 means the cancellation of your visa. Um, and, and that prison sentence is essential because it's an essential part of it. If you're in prison for more than one year and one day, that's when the Australians become really brutal to their Anzac brothers, isn't it? It's really that's brutal. Correct. That's correct, Liz, yeah. yeah there's, but there's boys here that haven't done 12 months in one day. There's boys that have only done four months jail and then, and then they, they come under bad character and that's them gone home, you know. But they've been here for 50 years. You know, and, and, and it might only be for drink driving or driving without a, a, a driver's license more than three times, and that's you gone. You know, I I don't believe in judging anybody. When you've done your time in prison, you've done your time in prison. But your story about prison is an absolutely heartbreaking story. Are you willing to share that on this interview? Absolutely, of course. It it just shows the kind of man you are, and um, you know, I, I yeah, my, just the injustice of it. So, so tell us what happened as as much as you can in an overview. We don't yeah. have to go into vast details. No, that's fine. It's, it's, it's fine. Um, so, um, we we went to a dinner at a restaurant. Uh, There's like a, a pub uh, in the restaurant of the pub, um, and I, I wasn't drinking. We we hadn't really had any drinks at all. We were eating dinner. I was driving that night. Uh, myself and my brother and his partner, Michelle, um, we went outside for a, um, a cigarette and there was a group of um, boys. There was an AFL after party after a game. There's an AFL party there. And there was three big boys standing on the front door. And um, when we went to walk back inside, one of the big guys put his hand up to Michelle to give her a, um, a high five. And mm. he missed, missed her hand on purpose and grabbed her ass. Mm. Um, and he was laughing and him and the boys were high-fiving, thinking it was a great joke. We walked inside and Michelle told my brother about what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and my brother walked back out there and, and fronted him, you know, and said, mate, did you, did you grab her on the ass, you know? And they were all laughing and they said, well, what are you going to do about it? My brother's hit him um, and a bit of a, like a bit of a brawl started. Um, I've seen my brother get hit, hit from behind. And when I've gone and grabbed the guy that, that hit my brother from behind. Um, 
I heard a big crack, a big loud crack, and I turned around, and there was a guy, the guy, the original guy who um, who had sexually assaulted Michelle. He was lying on the ground. Um, my brother had hit him, had seen him. My brother had had been split, and he had a lot of blood in his eyes. And he looked up and seen this guy there, and he hit him. Just one mm-hmm. punch, but the guy's gone down and hit his head on the concrete. Um, we we've left. Once the ambulance, they, they, they all stopped. And once the ambulance got there, and that we, we all left and went home. Um, about three days later, the police came into my house and arrested me. Um, they took me for questioning. Um, of course, I, I didn't, didn't say anything. I just told them it wasn't, wasn't me, you know, and you're willing to give me a lie detector test or whatever, you know. I didn't, I didn't see what happened. Told them the truth. Um, and they charged me with grievous bodily harm. Um, you told them the truth, but were you, were you protecting your brother? You didn't say what had happened no, with your brother. I wasn't protecting him, but I didn't see what happened. And I'm yeah. not, I'm, so you couldn't yeah, be definitely a not going to say, I'm yeah. not going to say that my brother done it. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't speak to police. Um, yeah. just like we don't speak to guards or anything here, you know? Yep. Um, so yeah, so they charged me with grievous bodily harm. Um, I was on bail, uh, for two years. I had to sign in at the police station three days a week, surrender my passport. Mm-hmm. And I had a, I think it was a $20,000 surety. Mm. Um, so that, that went on for two years of court and things like that. Mm. Um, my lawyer said to us the whole way, the whole way along, look, you, you're going to get off it. You didn't do it. You're going to walk. Um, so it came time to, um, to get to district court and prosecution said, no, we've got enough evidence um, to go to trial. Um, in the meantime, every, every single court case that I had, the media were there. The media were there saying that I was a coward puncher, um, a one-hit coward puncher. I used my military skills on civilians. Um, just, they just made up this big story. You know, I hit the guy from behind while he was trying to flee, uh, flee a brawl. Just, it was all over the newspaper. It was all over Facebook. It was all over, you know, you can Google it and it's still up now. Um, Dre, how did that how did that feel? I think anybody who's been through a media mauling knows what that feels when you're when you're seeing things in the media that are not true, that are not who you are. How how did you cope with that? How did you cope with that? It was it was tough. I, I wanted to go and have my time on the media as well and give them my side of the story. Mm. But my lawyer told me that it's not you, we can't do that, you know, because they can use it against you and twist it and things like that. So I just had to keep the silence. It was frustrating, Liz. It, you know, it upset the family a lot. Um, and it also it tarnished my name. You know, I, had, I have a good name with business and things like that. We have investors. We have overseas contracts and things like that. And it, it hurt our company as well. Um, and I'm going to ask you here why, why you stayed silent. But was, was it the love for your brother? Was it, was it the loyalty yeah, to I, your brother? We've, we've, been, we've grown up. You know, our mum taught us from a young age, you don't talk to police, you know, because they use it against you. Um, even if you haven't done anything wrong, just say no comment, you know, because then it helps the lawyers as well to, to back your story, you know. So you, under pressure you can say the wrong thing sometimes. The police can put words in your mouth, you know. As can the press. Um, this is your younger brother and you were not going to put him in it. You would rather take the fall than have – and you'd wear those – those cruel comments, you'd wear all of that media mauling and you'd even wear going to prison to protect your own brother. Is that right, Jay? Was hope yeah, right? I was, I was willing, I was willing, absolutely. I was willing to go to prison for my little brother, of course. But this brought on a huge guilt trip for my little brother. You know, we're, we're best friends. And knowing that his older brother was going to, um, going to be going to prison possibly for his crime, it was massive guilt trip on my brother. And numerous times throughout that two years of bail, my brother, off, he said, look, I'm going to go to the police station and do the right thing and hand, my, hand myself in. Um, we, we talked to a lawyer about it and the lawyer said, no, no, don't, don't do anything yet. Dre, they, they want to charge Dre with the crime. Let's go, you know, we'll, we'll take it to trial. He didn't do it. You'll walk. So we, we trusted the lawyer's word. Um, come, come time to trial. My brother stood up in front of the jury. He stood up in front of the courtroom, the judge, and he admitted to everything. You know, he told them the whole story. Um, he told them why he hit the guy. He told them it, everything, you know. He swore, swore on, on oath. And, um, yeah, the, the jury s- still didn't believe him, you know. Partly, I, I know that it's, it's a lot because of uh, Danny Green, the boxer. 
Danny Green's a, a, a big name over here in Australia. The, Australia love him. He's, he's got a campaign called a, a coward punch campaign or a one hit campaign or something like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And he done about half an hour spiel on, on TV about me being a coward puncher and being a, you know, a military thug and, all, and I should be out of this country, kicked out of this country and, and all this rubbish. Um, it wasn't even the, the right story, you know, telling me I hit people, hit, hit the guy from behind and things like that. But I never got to tell my side of the story um, until he came to jail for a seminar. He came to prison in it for a seminar and I got my time with him in front of 400 prisoners. I stood up in the stand and I had it out with Danny Green. I, I let him know that I was inside partly because of what he had done. Um, wow. I let him know that he only took one side of the story and he ran with that to make me look so bad, to, you know, to put me away in jail when he didn't know the full story, you know. And that's it, it, that's it, a yeah. scene worthy of a movie. How did, how did Danny Green react? Danny Green, um, he, was, he was really shocked. Um, he came up after the, after everything, he came up and tried to give me a hug, you know, and shake my hand and apologize. And if there was anything that he could do, um, to help me with, with my appeal or anything that he was willing to help me. He just said that, look, oh, I'm given a piece of paper from police and I'm told to read this out for my campaign. You know, I'm told to read oh, this out. And I said, no, you, you can destroy, well, you've, you've destroyed my life. You know, you, you can destroy lives by doing that, you know, and um, that's and that's what the media do, and that's what the media are doing in this country to good people as well, yeah, Try, people let, who are standing up for our freedoms. I'll mm. put it into perspective on how much damage it did. I had a ten day jury trial. The jury came back after forty minutes and came back. All twelve jury members were guilty. That that that, um, that never happens. They should have taken four or five hours to go over all the evidence of ten days. They came back within 40 minutes and all, all guilty, you know. Um, so that's the effect that the media had on the jury. Dre, can you um, take us to that moment when you're sitting in there? Your lawyer has said, oh, they'll let you off. You know that you didn't do it. You know that you've looked out for your brother. What, what yeah, did that feel was, like, that moment? Oh, to tell you the truth, I was absolutely shattered. I, mean, I, I had a partner at the time. Um, I had a partner at the time and um, – yeah, we were, I, was, I was doing really well. We are doing well, well with our company. My life was on track. I didn't, I didn't drink. I didn't party. Um, I was working. We are working hard. We were going to build our first house. Um, yeah, I was absolutely shattered, man. And then what made it kind of made it worse as well is we brought up, we brought up the fact that I'd, be, I'd served in the Army um, and served overseas, and we thought that that would help. You know, the, the respect of being an ex-serviceman would Absolutely help. it should. <laughs> it, it didn't. The prosecution just ru- just run with it, um, saying that you're trained as a lethal weapon and things like that. And it went against me, you know, and probably got me another six months on top of my sentence. Um, oh, Dre. Not good. I, 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 done, uh, military, I went to a military uh, psych um, and went, because I've been diagnosed with PTSD, with post-war trauma, Um yeah. From from being in a war zone, from being in a war zone, Dre. Yeah, yeah, just from army days. Yeah, but I went, I joined up at seventeen, young. You know, um, <sighs> but yeah, it, look, it, it shattered me. It t- turned my whole life upside down. I had to and start it, getting ready then. Yeah, for, for going to jail, you know. Yeah, and and you weren't expecting, it. and then you're taken straight out. That's it, isn't it? You 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 you're um, taken from the courtroom. It was about, not not from there. About three months later, you get given the sentencing date. Um, oh, right. And I was, I was sentenced, yeah, about three months after I was found guilty. Um, I was, I was um, sentenced to three years, yeah, in prison. Three years um, for something you hadn't done. So, I so, didn't even see it, yeah. So, Dre, how did you then cope in prison? How did you find the resilience that you clearly have? How did you dig into that um, to survive? Yeah, look, it was a really hard one for me, Um and probably different for me than a lot of other boys um, because I didn't do the crime. So I had to accept the fact that I was going to be inside for quite a long time for something that I didn't do. Um, but I didn't, it helped that it was my little brother and not, not someone else. Um, I don't know how these guys get charged with murder from do life and then find out it was someone else. I don't know how they do it. Um, 
but jail, jail was a was a shock for me. You know, I'm not used to being around prisoners. I, I wasn't around um, criminals in that on the outside. Um, I surrounded myself with good people on the outside, and yeah, it, it was a it was a big shock, a big shock for me. Um, but I um, once as soon as I got into prison, I was running running circuits. I trained, tried to help with my mental health. You know, it was just to train and. I learned to paint. I learned to play guitar. I um I taught Maori language. I taught Maori language. Wow. I had um I would have had about sixty students um, throughout oh. my prison, um, where I taught basic Maori, intermediate Maori, and advanced. Um, every Friday I run kapahaka and and waiata classes, <laughs> and we also started Maori carving. We done Maori carving in prison um, because there's there's a lot there's a lot of guys in jail that have spent their whole life the Maori boys or, or Kiwi boys, sorry, Kiwi boys in general, they've, um, they've spent their whole life in Australia. They came here with their two. They've lost their culture, you know. They've, they don't know even mm. how to say hello. All they know is mm. chirp. That's it, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so we, we decided that we were going to take these young boys in because a lot of these boys are joining gangs over here mm. ready for when they get back to New Zealand because they're not mm. going to have any family back there. They've got no money. They've got nowhere to go. So they join clubs here. They join yeah, to diff- different clubs here. And so that when they get home, they've got someone to pick them up, someone to get them a job, someone to live, um, some support back home. Mm-hmm. Um, so we decided not try and get those boys away from that scene um, mm-hmm. and tried to get them used to culture, you know, tried to, tried to um, teach them about, about our culture back in New Zealand, you know, language and um, different protocols back home, just so that they, they felt like they would fit in. Um, and then they did. A lot of my students come in learning. They, they, they can stand up and do a five corridor now in front of everyone, <laughs> you know. They know the songs. We created our own haka in jail. Oh, uh, wow. I'll tell it all. Yeah, we created our own haka. I'd love to, love to get the boys to show you in a couple of days' time, Liz. I'd Probably love it. Will you, this, but will you film it? And will you awesome film haka. it? Absolutely, yeah. of course. Absolutely, yeah, of course. and we'll put it on at the end yeah. of this interview. We'll, we'll edit it yeah. in. What a, a really what hearty, a... hearty haka. And yeah. um, we all sat down in a class one day and we wrote down different things that we would like to, to – the message we'd like to get across in our haka. And it was things like um, we've been brought together, um, charged with different crimes or whatever, you know, brought to our knees, but now we've binded together. We're back on our feet. We're ready to go home on our journey back home. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a really, it's a really nice hockey. You know, we're taking our koha back with us, you know, and everything we've learned over here back home to pass on and a lot about knowledge and things, you know, Maori lives. It's, it's a, it's a really hearty, um, haka. Yeah. I would love to, love to show you this. Yeah. Do you we know something for a lot of people over here and throughout the prison? Yeah. Anzac days, Waitangi day. Yeah. Beautiful. So it's it's like you've created a family out of their brothers. They're your brothers. Absolutely. Every Sunday we um we all get together, all the Maori, all the boys get together, you know, and and we hang out for a couple of hours and play touch, and uh, we have a big feed together. We make fry bread and things like that, you know, (laughs) with what we've got. Yeah, we we do all right. There's there's one on your on your TikTok who's the most beautiful musician. He picks up a guitar and it's like. Kind of classical <laughs> Spanish yeah. guitar a little bit. There's just Absolutely. beautiful. He's just he's just a musician through and through, I and know. he's just got. I can't s- wait to get him home and get yeah. him into the music studio. Yeah, because he's going oh, to do really well. Definitely. What's his name? Give us his name. His name's Philip Ocoso. Mm. Samoan boy. So Phil Phil has only probably spent a year in New Zealand his whole yeah. life. Wow. He's born and raised in Sydney, and he's going back there. He does have some distant uncles and things in South Auckland, but. A lot of these boys, Liz, are also relying on me to help them get them work back home. Oh, I'm pretty much one, one of the only one of the only boys that would have a lot of contacts back there um, still to try and get them labouring work or scaffolding work and things like that, you know? Um, well, we're going to put a call out now for um, Kiwis to help get our 501s home, first of all, but we also yeah. need a group of Kiwis to come together and we need a leader of this group. Uh, I would do it, Absolutely. but I'm, I've just got so many other things on. I need a leader of a group to be the welcoming home party for our 501s and to find Absolutely. ways to get them jobs and to find ways to help them get homes. Um, I interviewed a terrific guy, Steve Oliver, from Oliver's MMA gym, and I'm going to talk yep. to Steve about it too 
and see if with all that he's got going on, if he might be able to help um, get some people We do have together. some but, good fighters here, Liz. <laughs> yeah, I bet you <laughs> we do. Got, we got some, we got some good boxers here, yeah. I bet sure. you do. But, but we need Kiwis to help, and I'm going to need a group to help raise funds for you um, really seriously for all you boys. I, I think, um, I don't know, hearing your story, you're just – you're just so impressive. Just so, You're such a hero. Also, I just wanted to tell you, I, I, I did start a um, I did start a soldier support group in prison. It is the first one in Australia. Um, what what I found is that with with soldiers, we kind of um, we don't like to talk to to, to shrinks. You know, mm. we like we like to. It's a lot easier for us to relate to other soldiers. So if we are struggling in, within ourselves, it's 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 not like us to go down and sit with a lady with a with a clip or lady or man with a clip clipboard mm. and talk our problems mm. out because they they're not going to understand what we're what we're going through or what we've been through or anything like that. Mm. Um, so what I did is we, we had two soldiers inside jail um, attempt suicide um, while we're in there just because they couldn't cope mentally. They have a lot of, of a lot of issues, you know. They've done time over in um, Ireland and Africa and. You know, and they just couldn't cope inside with the with the pressure in there and dealing with their emotions. So I am um, soldiers support group where we get together um, and we can talk amongst each other. Um, I was on call 24-7. If any of the soldiers ever needed someone to talk to or they had tried suicide or anything like that, then we would go wow. straight straight and talk to them, you know, and, and, and pull, pull them out of it, you know. Um, it's really powerful, but we had no support, no support from the prison. No support from the RSLs or anything here. No support from the return veteran services. One, one, there was 37, 37 ex-military out of 1,800 prisoners in our, in our jail. I think it's like 2%. Um, wow. What do you put that down to, Dre? Is that because of the PTSD when they come out, there's depression, there's not coping with life? What do you think is... I know exactly what it is, Liz. It's, there's no support once you leave the military. A lot of boys mm-hmm. have their skeletons and things like that, you know, and when they're in, in, uh, in the army, they're, they're fine. They're surrounded by, by soldiers. Your, your mm-hmm. mind's in the game. Yeah. But then when you're out, you're, you're off out, out to, to the civil life and the civilians and that, and you kind of just dropped. There's no support. There's no help. There's no nothing. Mm-hmm. You're, you're out there and you're trying to deal with your mind and you're different to everyone else because you think like a soldier. You're different. You don't think the same as other people. Your jokes are going to be different to other people's mm. jokes, you know. Um, and tell me about that. Tell me about the. Tell me about the differences. What What differences do you notice in yourself that make you think? I don't quite. I, I don't quite think like everybody else in society because of my military work. What do you think that is? This is a really important um, thing. We, you know, I've never thought until now. Gosh, our, our boys who serve and we make such a fuss on Anzac Day, they need ongoing support when they leave. Absolutely, man. Yeah, and that's what myself and Shane Anderson. Um, he's another prisoner that was in there. He served in second first RNZ with myself, mm-hmm. um, and also another guy from New Zealand Army as well, Hayward Marsh. There was four of us, all from mm-hmm. second first from Christchurch. You know all in the jail together, a small jail in Western Australia all together. Um, there's a, what is I that difference, just, um, do you think? No, yeah, what's that difference you've been, about? You've been, you've been in the army for so many years, you know, and you're into routines. You're into, you know, yeah. you, you're surrounded by your, your mates and your peers. You talk about, uh, you know, different things that you wouldn't talk about out in civil life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then and when you, you get to civil life, yeah. you, you, you don't feel like you can talk to yourself or be yourself around people, you know, mm. um, you might have a lot of anxiety. You might have panic attacks and things like that. Yes. So people mask, mask their issues with, um, with alcohol, with drugs, uh, with gambling, yes. yeah. they, they mask it. And, and then that, that leads, that can lead to domestic violence. And there's a lot of patterns. I went around and done a survey in the jail, in the jail and it just about 70% of the people in there are in for domestic violence, drugs mm. or alcohol, you know, um, Jay, it's sad that oh, they're, using, they're using that to mask instead of dealing with it. Wouldn't it be you know? amazing yeah. to reform? I reached out to a lot of, quite a, 
it would be amazing to have someone like you who's been through the system to really give advice on how to reform all of this because we need a vastly different of course. I was saying in an interview that, uh, this morning with a with a lawyer I was talking to we need a, a totally new parliament now we can't have this corrupt lot running our country we need a totally new media we need a totally new health system we sure as heck need a totally new prison system or, or a way of dealing with people who are falling out of society because so often um, I, I, I looked at your I looked at your TikTok and you know what I thought, Dre? I thought such <laughs> talent, such talent. I mean, some of there them are, some of them are wicked and some of them are shocking. And don't be shocked because it just they're just incredibly. We're not trying to shock anyone. No, is, yeah. you're yeah. very We're honest. Not to give you insight, you know. Yeah, and they're very like creative. Life. There's humor, and they're yeah. obviously trying to keep the spirits up of the boys. Let's get back to the 501. So you're stuck in this place. You've come out of prison and you want to get home. But instead of, the, of this government do. in New Zealand bringing you home because the Australians are now saying, we don't want you, you are, you are just in no man's land, it seems to me. You're out of prison, but you're in a detention centre, which you said earlier is worse than prison in some ways. So, yeah, look, so what I, happened? I, I was, Were you, after the three we years... We forgotten, Liz. We, the boys here, they feel forgotten. We, we don't get New Zealand embassy. We don't get them coming here and talking to us and, and reassuring us that we're going to get home. Some of the Kiwi boys here, if you're fighting for a visa, they stick you up at Christmas Island and you'll sit up there to rot for three or five years, where, whatever it is, you know, until you've lost your battle and then you head home. Probably 2% of people will win their visa back um, throughout, you know, and mainly because they've got children here is a, is a big one, you know. Um, we the boys feel we feel forgotten here. We don't we don't have anyone saying, "Oh, you're going you're going to be flying home in in uh, in March. You're going to be home." You know, we don't have any of that. They'll give you a couple of days' notice. Oh, here's your flights. You're gone. You know, and and we're just sitting here every day, just drags out, drags out. We're hoping that someone will knock on our door and say, "Mate, here's your tickets. You're going home." And um, there's nobody to talk to. There's no one from the New Zealand embassy, as you say. There's nobody. We there. had Border Force come out. Border yeah. Force come out once a month or something, you know. And um, but they, they're just not. Well, they're not helpful. We, we, they don't can't tell you anything. They can't and tell you. Anything. They just apologise all the time, you know. Do we know if it's the New Zealand government that's dragging the chain on this, or is it the Australian government, or is it both of them? Do we know? I'd only. It would only be assumption. I'd be assuming. Liz, we don't get told anything. We, we got told when we were in jail, sign your paperwork here for you to go back to New Zealand voluntarily. Um, you'll be at the detention centre maybe two or three weeks and we'll have you on a flight back home, on charter flight back home. Well, we've got boys who have been here for years, still waiting, you know. The, some, some boys get lucky and they'll be here for a couple of weeks and then they're gone. But because of the borders of being shut, we, we've all had our double jabs. We're all vaccinated. We're all ready to go home. We've come straight out of prison, no COVID. We've come in here, there's no COVID. I don't know why we can't just go straight home. And we're, that we're was my next that was my next question. Is the quarantine something that existed before COVID, didn't it? It was there before COVID. Am I right? No, no, no. And even during COVID, even like say, say in July, the boys would come come here, not even vaccinated at all. They'd come here for two weeks, fly back to New Zealand, no quarantine. Off they go on the streets, you know. But you were saying some of them have been here for years. Oh, you mean they've lived there for years? You didn't mean they've been in quarantine for years. You didn't. You didn't not, mean that. They're not quarantined for years. They've been in detention centre for in years. You know, in detention centre. So just just yeah. explain the difference. You're in quarantine there, are you, or are you in detention centre? No, no, no. We're we're, okay. we're in a detention centre here. But when we fly back to New Zealand, we still have to do two weeks quarantine. Quarantine, right. So so just explain how COVID has affected the 501s because I need to be very clear on that. There are guys who come yeah. out of prison who are being rejected by yeah. Australia and they've been put in the detention centre and some of them are just languishing there for years, right? Now COVID Absolutely. comes in in 20, beginning of 2020. What difference did that make in the detention centre? What was the what was the impact? Um, well, visits. Let's do visits. Visits mm -hmm. are all non-contact. You're not allowed to kiss your partner. You're not allowed to hug your partner. You've got a screen mm -hmm. in between you. Your partner has to wear a mask. Um, in jail, we didn't get visits for four months. There were four or five months <sighs> we got no visits. You know. Um, and you need to see your family. It helps you keep going. It gives you morale. 
Um, and when you don't see a family for months and, and partners or children, children's the worst here for the boys. Children, it, it kills the boys, man. Um, and if we didn't have each other, some of these boys would, I don't, I don't know, you know, but it breaks them, you know. Um, oh, Dre, tell me more. They, they really live to see their kids. They really live for those visits. And a lot of them have been here for 30, 40 years. So they, their children are all here, you know. Some of the boys have got newborns and stuff. Their families are all here. They set up the houses here. They don't know anyone in New Zealand. But you're, you're saying here, here you're saying there. Australia. You're talking about Australia. Yeah, yeah of course, Australia, you know. Yeah. yeah. And they might have, um, my friend, I'm not, I won't mention any names, but he, he got caught with, I think, maybe $250,000 cash. Um, he's getting deported. He's gone. Cash isn't illegal, you know. Is he, He's gone. That's his first time in court. There he goes. He's off. He's going back to New Zealand where he left when he was two or three years old. It's <laughs> very... Partner, everything's here, you know? What's, it what, is what do you mean? brutal. There's nothing you can do. Yes. The Australian government just <laughs> seems brutal on this. But, but getting... How did you get through those early months of COVID in prison when there were no visitors ah. and, and the morale? How did you keep the, your own morale up and help the other boys? What, what happened? You see, you just, nobody's you just, discussed this during the COVID yeah. two years. No one's thought of our You've boys just, in prison. You just go with it. There's, um, there's nothing you can do, nothing at all. So you just go with it. In jail, you just go about yourself and you train, you train hard to stay all right mentally. Um, they did actually, the, one good thing is that they made the phones in jail free, free phone calls. Mm. So the boys could spend time talking to their families and that 10 minute phone calls, you know, um, mm. where well, they also done something similar to this. They did a WebEx and once a week we could talk to, I used to talk to my mum and my dad back in New Zealand. Um, it was, it was amazing because I got to see back home. I got to see them face to face. Um, I got to make sure that they're okay. Um, and just check in, you know, it was awesome. And Webex has really, really helped all of our boys keep in touch with their family, you know, and that's, I think that's how we got through it. Um, the COVID, the, the boys are still going through it. It hasn't stopped inside jail, you know. So how much, how we, much we keep in touch with our boys inside there now? Do you? Through Webex, yeah. Absolutely. Once a week we have a Webex with our boys in jail, yeah. Keep what I going. think what I think yeah. we need from you is we need um we need you to hold up, you know, a piece of a piece of paper, each of you with maybe the first name, Kiwi from where, you know, if, if there is a place you've come yeah. from, and how many how long you've been in the detention center. And maybe you could film that one after the other, one after the other, because of these people need we do to be have a named. video like that on TikTok. Oh, I didn't see that one. Mm. Yeah, we, 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 we've got another one going up today and it's just the boys introducing themselves and where they're from. That's what um, I need. Where they've come from in, in Australia and where they're heading back home, you know. Um, yep. We don't put their charges on there. We no. Don't, we don't want to sound like we're bad people, you know. We're, we're not bad people, man. These boys are top boys. Um, if everybody they're, they're deserves. Lo loving. They're human, yeah. they're loving, you know. Yeah. The, the, the crime, they might have committed a crime years ago. Um, they might not have even done the crime, but if they have done the crime, so, so be it. They've done their punishment. And now we're doing a second punishment. We're doing a second sentence. There it why, is. Why isn't, why isn't this three or four months of us doing this time taken off our jail sentence, you know? Why Absolutely. are we doing jail and then coming here and doing jail again? We, we should, I, I would have been out with my family two, two months ago, you know, but I'm not. I'm going to be here for months and months trying to get home. How do you know? time, you know? How do, it's so well said, Dre. How do you know it'll still be months more? What's making you think that? We, we look at the news every day, Liz. I know, I know I shouldn't believe the media because of what's happened to myself, my own experiences, but we do. We look at the news. We look at the New Zealand hub. We look at, you know, we look at the news every day, hoping that flights are going to be opening up soon. Um, mm. Jacinta's going to accept 501s back. Um, we don't. We, we only see negative stuff, you know. We see stuff the other day saying there's a politician saying, "Turn the planes around. Let's send the 501s back to Australia. We don't want them. The crime rate's too high back in New Zealand." There's that, a reason that, why that crime, the 501 uh, crime rate, is so high in New Zealand. There's, and I explained it before. You're dropping us off at an airport where we know no one. We we don't have anything. All our money's been spent on lawyers and things like that. You're dropping us off. You're giving us $180 cash one week's free accommodation in a halfway house, and then you're on your own. 
Why, why, why do you think the boys are, 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 why do you think the crime rate's going up? They've got nothing back home. They're, there's no, yeah, that's the, that's the, that's my, I, the way I, I see it anyway, Liz, you know, not all 501 should get labelled like that either. Dre, um, what would, what would you do if you were in charge? What would, what would you do given your, you, you're obviously very bright, you're very smart and you've got all this you. experience and you've got natural leadership. What would you do as a leader here? A leader back home? Yeah. Um, bringing the boys back or helping the boys yeah. 501s? Yeah, if you, if you were, if you were this, if you were this prime minister and, and she had a heart, which we don't know, and she was listening to this and she went, you know, these are, these are human beings. They've done their time. They d- deserve a fresh start and we're going to look after them and reintegrate them into this country. Where would you go from there? What steps would you offer? Look, what would help you? At the end you? of the day, Liz, um, we're, we're Kiwis, you know. We're, we're New Zealanders. Absolutely. We're proud New Zealanders. New Zealand's yeah. home for us. Mm. I don't see why it's so hard that, to, for us to get home to our family. Some of us haven't seen our families in, in years and years, you know. I haven't had a Christmas back home in 18 years. Um, but look, I think there just needs to be a, lo- a lot of support for the boys so they don't yes. freak out. You know, I'm, even my, 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 my friends here, even though I'm, I'm with them and I'm going to be traveling back home with them and I'll do everything I can to get them work and places to stay and houses and that sort of thing. I, I can't do it alone. You know, I can't do it by myself. Mm. And these are, these are really good boys, man. They're family men, they're loving boys. I wouldn't hang around with them if they were bad people, you know? Not, you are such a know. good man and you're so caring. You are just so deeply impressive. So we need Kiwis to gather around. I'd like um, you to put up a bank account, uh, your bank account, and this will be money for the whole group of you and for Kiwis to give money at the end of this interview. Because, look, even if every Kiwi who watches this puts in the price of a coffee $5 or a couple of coffees $10, if we all do that, it will really help you guys. And that can be something really that is. can go towards the, the leadership. Now, you mentioned lawyers. What happens there? Do you have to, to go through lawyers to argue a case Absolutely. to get home? What happens? Yeah, so what, what, what happens is, is um, once, your, once your visa is cancelled while we're in prison, our visa's cancelled, we get notified your visa's been cancelled. You get 21 days to fill out these forms, basically. And all you're doing is you're trying to tell Home, of, um, home Affairs here or trying to get immigration to reverse their decision. They cancel your visa. You're trying to get them to reverse it and explain why, why you should stay in Australia, you know? And it all, every one of us, we, we try and revoke the decision. Um, Does anybody got, succeed, Dre? Does anyone succeed? I think about probably 2%, 4%, maybe 4% of people will succeed and get Brutal. their visas back. Brutal. Um, which is was tough, you know? I've, I had a lot going for me. I've been here for 17 years. I've worked the whole time. I've owned businesses. You've paid taxes I've the, to Australia? I've been in the army, of course. I've been in the army. My, my company is an environmental company, and we, we, we fly the Australian flag for our company. We're not Econets New Zealand. We're Econets Australia, and we we'll bring have a to lot change of that. work. We'll have to change yeah, that. We'll, we'll, not, um, we'll talk that about <laughs> We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about that as the good news we, we, at the we end. Work, we work for the environment, you know, and we're, and we're trying to do a really good thing by, by preserving the marine life and, and everything in, in Australia. But these guys are just willing to kick you out, you know, and you're gone. They don't, they don't care, as you know. But it's we're just really, another statistic, another number, you know. It's really brutal. Yeah. If, if I was Ardern sitting here, not, not Liz Gunn, and you were talking down the camera to Ardern, what would you say to her? Just, just stop for a moment, shut your eyes and think, I just want to speak from my heart. What is it you'd say to her about you and your boys and what's needed here? We... Um, we, we just feel forgotten, Liz. We don't have any contact with any government members from New Zealand or anything like that. We don't get phone calls or emails or, or anything. We haven't been given any dates on when we're coming home. We just, we just want, want, want a bit of support, you know. We're, we're from New Zealand and I know some of us have made some mistakes and things like that, but ev- everyone makes mistakes, you know. We just want to come home, be with our family. Some of us, myself, I, I want children, you know. I want to start, start mm-hmm. my life fresh. Um, and we, we, we just want to get home, Liz. We're, this is not a nice place. Um, we, we just want out of Australia now. We want to, we want to come home. And it feels like we're, we've just been rejected, basically, from both countries. Is what, it was how we feel. So there is a lot, Dre, of brutality going on in New Zealand at the moment. And I'm talking the brutality of the 
of the jabs, I'm interviewing a lot of jab injured Kiwis who are feeling almost mm. exactly what you're feeling. They're feeling like we, we, we did what we were asked to do. We've done our time as it were, it's their equivalent. We've done our jab and now we've jab injured and this, this government is forgetting us. So I think what we're going to need is a lot of Kiwis to get behind that and get stories potentially in our mainstream media, demand that there are stories, write to our media and say we need stories about getting your boys home, something that will make this government show some heart because they're not showing any heart towards the jab injured. So at the moment, this is yeah, a rugged time. Hard at all. Yeah. But what I'd like, what I'd like, Jay, is if if any Kiwis want to write to you and start to link in with you as the leader here, what's an address yeah. they could write to you? Just, I mean, letters, old-fashioned letters or emails. What's what's a good one? Maybe give your email address. Yeah, absolutely. My, my email address is um, Dre Smith, D R E S M I T H, nineteen eighty four at hotmail dot com. Look, I'm, I'll, I'll reply to every single email. There's, um, I do on the TikTok. I reply to as many messages as I can, um, just because people are interested in our in, in what happens in here. Look, mm. I, we we don't film any of the bad things that happen in here. You know, I got I could show you a lot. We don't film the boys depressed. We don't f- film them sleeping all day because they don't want to get up. We we don't film any of that. We try and film a lighter side of detention of detention center and and our lives in here. Um, but it's it's not. There's a lot of depressed people in here, you know, really down. Um, there's a lot of suicide attempts. Um, there are a lot, people, are there? A lot of attempts. Of course. Absolutely. Of course. Because they're, what we're, they're, we're rotted. We're, we don't, we haven't been given any dates. We haven't been updated. I'm not talking about myself. I've only just got here. I've been here only for a few months, but there's boys who have been here for eight years, 10 years. They can't go back to their country because their country won't take them in. Australia won't have them in their in their um, civil life. So here you are. This is the rest of your life here. You were saying there's well, one boy from there's one guy from Tonga, and and Tonga will not take any of the five hundred ones. Is that right? We've got two boys here. They've been here for four years, and Tonga refused to take any five hundred ones back, and that Australia is. refused to have them out there. So this is them here. They're trying now to get refugee status to a different country. That Otherwise, is just what, shameful. A 501 has done their time in prison, right? They've done Absolutely. their punishment. It's done. They, it's done. Yes. It's over. It should be a clean slate. So we need to bring them back to New Zealand as well. We need to look after them as well. This is Absolutely. just so, so wrong. So so what are some of the other things? When you got there, you saw people, what, curled up in bed, sort of in a fetal position some days, just so dumb. They just, everyone's just lying around. They just mope around. And look, we... The, the Kiwi boys and that we've we've we've, we've, we've grouped together, man. We're we're a tight bunch. We really we we hang out every single day. You know, we keep the morale up. We play cards. We play touch together. We play basketball. We train together. We have a was, laugh, you know, and try and was we play was a lot of together. that was a lot of that you're doing, Dre, because you got this TikTok no. thing going. So oh, no, I, no, I want to no. talk about that. I did the TikTok thing, you know, but it was just for a laugh because I didn't know much about. Oh man. Look, Liz, it took me an hour and a half to set up an email address when I got out of jail, you know. <laughs> Things have changed. <laughs> Things have changed, you know. And I got this TikTok thing and I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool, you know. And I thought, maybe we'll do some videos to give everyone a laugh, you know, and show and, them our life inside here. And that keeps the morale up. I need to say at this point that you've had, I think, something like 3.1 million views, haven't you? You've had a lot of views. No, it's, it's 3.8 million on just one video, yeah. Look, we, 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 we never good. ever thought that it would I didn't I didn't think that people were interested in our lives, you know. I didn't I'm really surprised that I got the phone call from you, Liz. I I, I just once you get here, you just kind of write write everything off and just do your time day in, day out, ready to come home, hoping that one day we, we're gonna get back there soon. But we, we've, there's a lot of love, man, on that page. I think we've got nearly forty thousand followers in two weeks. 40,000 followers and 400,000 likes and, you know, and a lot of people write some really nice things, you know, they can't wait till the 501s come home and we wish you all the best. There's a lot of haters, of course. There's a lot of haters and we don't, we just ignore that shit, you know, saying, saying bad things, you know. They say we're in the boneyard and if you didn't touch kids, you wouldn't go to jail. Just, just stupid kiddie stuff, you know. It's horrendous. It's horrendous. I interviewed a really seriously injured um 
uh, woman and and someone called Ozzy Bob keeps keeps putting all these ghastly, ghastly messages. And he's just a really sad, yeah. pathetic individual or a government mole. We need to yeah. get you boys home. And you've put this TikTok post up and got all this following. You're really bright and Absolutely. smart. You have a lot to offer New Zealand in addition to your leadership. Are you there? Are you still yep, able sorry, to be there? Liz. That's okay. Yep. That, no, that's fine. Right. That's fine. In addition to your leadership, you have started a business that is quite phenomenal. Tell me about it. Let's let's go into that positive. Absolutely. All right. So um, probably about nearly uh, eight or nine years ago, um, myself and my brother owned a scaffold company here in Perth. We were getting undercut. Um, we weren't making much money. Um, so we decided to, to sell the company. Um, we did so. And we... Um, we decided we wanted to do something that we love doing. Um, myself and my brother brought up in Whangapuroa in New Zealand on the Hibiscus Coast. And um, we li- we've been around the water our whole lives. We decided we wanted to do something about diving, um, be underwater every day because it's hot weather here. Um, and we did. We, we decided that we were going to clean bottoms of boats. Um, cleaning the bottom of a boat in the marina, there's no currents. There's only tides, you know. Yeah. So all the stuff you clean off the bottom of the boat is going to sit on the bottom of the marina, leach, toxic mm. um, anti-fell paints, you know, heavy metals and things, and it's going to pollute the water. So we came up with an invention called um, – it's, it's, it's the EcoNet, basically, and it's a drive-in boat wash, a drive-in hull cleaning system um, where we collect all the, the biofell, all the waste, and we process it all, you know. We process it so fisheries and things like that can see, can go through it with a magnifying glass. They can see foreign algae or – um, invasive pests and things like that that are coming from other countries that are going to affect the, the reef, you know. So we've had meetings over the years. We've had investors. We've, we're, it's, it's gone a long way. Econets Australia, you'll see the, the website. Um, we've, got, we've got a few products now that we have painted, it. Um, a few inventions that we've got. We're trying to get, um, we're trying to get the government really to, to make it compulsory to have your boats growth on the bottom of the boat minimal, you know, because it does leach bad, bad things, you know, and does yes. it, it, um, it spreads it around the country affecting, you know, reef and, and marine life. Um, from that came our bubble curtains. Um, we work with a company called Canadian Pond over in Canada and they're a great company. You can look them up as well. They're awesome, man. They've got some great environmental products, but these are bubble curtains. Um, they're high pressure air bubbles that go on the, under, on the ground. Um, they're amazing, man. You can use them for a lot of things. They can contain oil spills. They contain fuel wow. spills. Um, they contain algae blooms. Um, they, they do uh, vibration underwater for the um, pylon driving and that, so it doesn't affect the turtles or the dolphins using the sonar and that wow. sort of thing. Um, we also filter drains, any drains, sewer drains that are running bad water out into the ocean. We'll filter the whole thing, you know, make sure that that water is clean. We, 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 put, we, we tried to get the conduit to pick up all the seaweed along all the beaches, you know, we were going to turn all that kelp and dead kelp and waste into, um, instead of going to landfill, we we're going to turn into fertilizers for the gardens. Fantastic um, idea. I've always thought all, that should also, be. We were going to can compact them down and make them into fire logs as well. Um, Cause it's, it's, it's carbon free. And yeah, we, we were going to um, turn them into fire logs with natural scents and things like that to help with anxiety and depression and stuff like that, you know, oh. aroma scents and, yeah, it, it just it didn't happen, but this is what I'm going to push for for New Zealand. Um, Trey, it's absolutely I'm incredible. Really, um, it's, off it's New Zealand as much as possible. Absolutely, and it's yeah. clear to me you are so smart. You are just a natural businessman or you're a natural inventor or an ideas man, we should say, and what you need sure. is some good investors, and this would just take off and help our environment here. It's absolutely, really exciting. Yeah. But but yeah. you have I've, had some good news. Haven't you got a contract in Fiji waiting for you? Haven't you got No, absolutely. Look, we, we do. Um, yeah. I've been talking in talks with the Fijian government. Look, I know a lot from research and things like that. Fiji waters are very polluted at the moment. Yes. Um, absolute beautiful country, beautiful reef, beautiful diving, clear waters. But they had the tsunamis and things like that there. Yeah. And about eight big boats sunk in their harbour. That Now the oil and the fuel in that is starting to, to seep out, Ooh. you know, and it's killing a lot of marine life in that. So... I'm going to fly over there as soon as I can. I'm, I'm just hoping that I get home soon because they're waiting for a presentation from me. 
I want to go over there and I want to offer them as much as I possibly can to help them clean up their country, help them clean up all their harbors, their waterways, their reefs, um, yeah, ship, ship cleaning, the boats, all, all, the, all the international boats, they need to be cleaned before they enter <sighs> Fiji waters. Otherwise, they're bringing their invasive pests and foreign algae, and it's affecting the, 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 the reef of Fiji. And Fiji's a tourist. They, they thrive off tourism. Yeah. And we, we need them to, to, to help them to keep their, keep their country clean, you know. And they, a lot of the locals need the tourism over there. Dre, I reason. mean, there's no doubt in my mind at all that you would be an absolute gift to this country. I can just see all, all that you've done to help people in prison. The fact that you took the fall for your brother and it's, you know, it, it is a, a, probably some deep karmic thing. So he shouldn't feel guilty. You chose to do that for your brother. But what a hero. Absolutely. I mean, what a hero. Yeah, I'm not a hero. There's a, yeah, I'll just, you are. You yeah, are. Look, Dre. I think anyone would do it for their little brother, but I, I didn't put my hand up and say I did it. To 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 um to take the charge, you know, I just mm. I just went with it and just pled my innocence the whole way. And mm. at the end of the day, I got found guilty, and it is what it is, you know. I'm, I'm over it. I'm past it. I've done my jail. I've met some really good people. I've left my footprint in the prison, you know. We've got multi classes and we've got soldiers groups, and I've learned a lot, you know. I love my art now. I love painting. Um, I, I could never paint, man. I never had time on the outside. I worked six or seven days a week. And now I love painting. I love sitting there and painting landscapes. I've done a lot of New Zealand Māori landscapes and things like that. The old Māori chiefs, and uh, I, I love it. Yeah. Could you cool. send us? Yeah. Could you send us some photos of those as well? I'd like to put that on at the end. We've got a bit of. We've got yeah. a bit to put on at the end. We yeah, will course. do our part. Absolutely. I would. I would love you to send me. Um, the haka that you film tomorrow. Of we'll course. edit this on to yep. the end of it. And then photos yep. of your art. Uh, it's been a real delight, Dre, and we will keep in touch now by email. And I'd like you just to give me a weekly update on where you are. Oh, <laughs> 